planning and study, of working together toward a common goal, culminates in a joint endeavor by two great friendly nations, the United States and Canada, the opening of the Great Lakes to the fleets of the high seas. The tremendous job of deepening the channel from Lake Superior to the Atlantic Ocean by way of the St. Lawrence River began in 1954. In addition, bridges, dams, and locks had to be built to permit large ocean-going vessels to travel from ports in the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. The lake cities became seaports, and the distance from the Middle West to Europe was greatly shortened. Tremendous electric power developed at hydroelectric plants at Iroquois, Ontario, and Messina, New York, was an added benefit to communities and cities as far away as 150 miles. In deciding how the formal opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway during June 1959 should be commemorated by postage stamps, stamp advisory committees of the United States and Canada met at Ottawa, Ontario during 1958. The decision was for the two governments to issue commemorative stamps identical in design except for the necessary differences in caption and denomination. Both Canadian and American artists submitted designs. This is the sketch of the design selected for simultaneous release by both countries. The United States stamps would be of the four cent denomination, the Canadian five cents, normal first class surface letter mail postage for each country. The United States stamps were printed at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, Washington, D.C., where all United States postage stamps and currency are processed. At this bureau, a skilled artist painstakingly developed an engraving design from the artist's sketch. After Postmaster General Arthur E. Summerfield approved the finished artwork design, an engraver traced it lightly cutting all pertinent details into a clear gelatin sheet. He then transferred the design in reverse to the face of a soft polished steel die using a wax process. Etched into the steel die by acid, the design was strengthened by hand engraving until it carried the proper amount of tone. Color proofs were then run off, and this one was approved by Postmaster General Summerfield. The completed design was pressed into a transfer roll, from which a siderographer rolled out a master plate of 200 stamps in accordance with exacting requirements. Printing plates made from this master plate were rounded as required for the Giori press. The Giori rotary press prints from one to three colors in one operation using a single recess engraved plate and the required number of inking rollers. At the feeding end of the Giori press, 5,000 sheets of special pre-gummed stamp paper is a normal load. The sheets are slightly oversized to permit trimming. This load will print into a million stamps. The sheets are fed automatically into the press, gum side down, to the plate cylinder. As the sheets pass between the cylinders, two inking rollers of a special type are used to impress first one color, then the other, onto the plate in the area required for each color. Every revolution is a complete process on this Giori press. Inked, printed, wiped. Inked, printed, wiped. As soon as each sheet receives its impression, the automatic delivery system moves it over a drying belt toward a stacker. This press operates continuously 24 hours daily, except for necessary cleaning, re-inking, and plate changing. On this roller pallet are the 5,000 sheets of 200 printed stamps each, now ready for the next stage of production. After standing about eight hours, 
The printed sheets are perforated and trimmed in size, first in one direction and then in the other direction. Now the trimmed and perforated stamps are examined for imperfections. Then 100 sheets of 200 stamps each are stapled on four sides between lightweight cardboard covers into large books. These large books are quartered into small books of 100 sheets of 50 stamps each. The staples from the previous operation bind each book securely. The small books pass through a covering machine and on down a conveyor belt while the amount, title of stamp, and the issue date are hand stamped on the cover. Here, the books are packaged into cartons for shipment in quantities as requested by the 35,000 post offices all over the United States. Strict regulations forbid the sale of these stamps before a specified date, except for the sale at the designated first day of issue city. The site of the United States hydroelectric plant, deriving water power for electricity from the seaway construction, Messina, New York, located at an advantageous spot on the St. Lawrence River, was selected for the first day cover ceremonies of the United States stamp. Weeks before the stamp issue date, the Messina post office became a busy place as requests from collectors desiring first day covers of the United States St. Lawrence Seaway commemorative stamp began to pour in. Envelopes were opened Orders checked accurately against money enclosures and the number of stamps to be affixed. Sheets of the new stamps were stripped into single lengths or blocks of four and carefully affixed on the covers, positioned to receive the clear first day postmarking so valued by collectors. On 26, 1959, marked the official opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway to ocean-going traffic. The historic event took place near Montreal, Canada, at the eastern approaches to St. Lambert Lock. The more than 50,000 spectators gathered for the occasion from all over the world greeted Queen Elizabeth II with a tremendous ovation, as they did for President Dwight D. Eisenhower. After the ceremonies, the Royal Yacht Britannia, with the Queen, President Eisenhower, and other dignitaries aboard, left Montreal for a five-hour cruise through part of the seaway. The Britannia's passage through the ceremonial gate spanning the approaches to St. Lambert Lock symbolized the official opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. As part of the official opening, Sheets of the stamps autographed by the Postmaster General were presented to Queen Elizabeth and President Eisenhower. And on this official opening date of the St. Lawrence Seaway, June 26, 1959, the commemorative postage stamps were officially cancelled for the first time. These are some of the first day covers with the new pictorial cancellation. After cancellation, the envelopes were sorted by skilled clerks to destinations all over the world. Some 540,000 first day covers of the St. Lawrence Seaway stamp were serviced, postmarked, and dispatched. The day after the official first day of issue at Messina, the St. Lawrence Seaway stamps were sold over the counters at every post office in the United States, in large cities, in small cities, and in small towns. Also, on the day after the first day of issue, 
the Seaway stamps were placed on sale at the Philatelic Sales Agency in Washington, D.C. Here, current postage stamps may be purchased at face value. Here, too, in a special section, Mail orders are filled for stamps of selected quality for philatelic use. You may order any quantity of currently available stamps by mail at face value plus return postage and a small handling charge. Enclose a postal money order or certified check with your orders and address them to the Philatelic Sales Agency, Post Office Department, Washington 25, D.C. An order form listing the stamps available may be obtained by sending a stamped addressed envelope to the same address. Commemorating the St. Lawrence Seaway, one of the greatest engineering feats of all time, two great friendly nations, the United States and Canada, for the first time in history, issued postage stamps of the same design. And now, the Postmaster General of the United States, Arthur E. Summerfield. The film you have just seen, the story of the St. Lawrence Seaway commemorative postage stamp, will show the American public, as well as stamp collectors, why commemorative stamps are issued, how they come into being, and how first day covers are processed. Stamp collecting is an outstanding hobby. Anyone can enjoy it, kings or statesmen, young or old, rich or poor. Stamp collecting has distinct educational values. No one can follow this hobby intelligently without acquiring a greater knowledge of his national heritage and a better understanding of the world. It is with pleasure that I dedicate this film to the millions of stamp collectors in, in the United States and to their fellow collectors throughout the world.